welcome. My name is Mitch Bolo. This is Indigenous Insights. Welcome back to the studio. Joining us today, we have James Vukulic, a descendant of Turtle Mountain, an international speaker, author, and the creator of Ojibwe Word of the Day. James, welcome to the studio. Miigwech. Ngechi miigwech wendom jayaya no oma no ngoma. I'm very grateful to be here with you Oh, today. man. It's good to have the language here. And I did introduce you in, langu- in the lang- uh, English, but I was wondering if you'd like to uh, go ahead and introduce yourself as one does in the language. Oh, uh-huh. miigwech. Buju wende noi maakanadok. Anin. Kage gabo indijinikas. Mekanak kandu dem. Mekanak wajawing and dunjaba. Besho gakaba kong and dao no ngom. And that was a, pro- a traditional protocol greeting. I said, hello, all of my relatives. My name is Kage Gabo. I'm Turtle Clan. I'm a descendant of Turtle Mountain. I live close to Minneapolis today, and I wanted to thank all of your listeners for listening today. Miigwech. All right, so, you know, give us the basics. Tell us a little bit about who you are and where you come from and your, a little bit of your history. Uh, well, again, I'm James Vuklich. I'm also Kage Gabo. I grew up in north central Minnesota, and... This always shocks people to hear this, but I didn't hear the Ojibwe language until I was a 25-year-old man. Uh, I was originally going to be a French teacher. I began with uh, film and video, moved to English, and studied French in Quebec. I did a year of immersion in uh, the Université de Quebec at Trois-Rivières. And when I came back, I had every intention of becoming a French teacher. And... uh, I saw Ojibwe was being offered the school at the City College in Minneapolis, and my mom's Ojibwe, my grandma's Ojibwe, and I thought, well, I'll give this a try. I've studied French, Italian, even some Latin. I haven't studied Ojibwe at all, and I remember hearing the most fascinating story about myself I had never been told. You know, and I hadn't been told that for a very good reason. My mother went to a boarding school. My grandmother and my grandfather went to a boarding school and a residential school. And they had no exposure at all to the language, to the culture, to the history and the spirituality. So uh, that became a very healing, fascinating, exciting spiritual journey. Uh, it's still the most exciting spiritual journey I've ever been on. So... So what did you know before that then, before you got, you know, learning the language, what did you know about your people, your culture, and your heritage? Aside from the displays at the Mille Lacs Museum, uh, practically nothing. Uh, again, there, when I was in high school, and even in college, there were not a lot of uh, our history, our story, our culture, our spirituality was rarely discussed. In high school, I think it was mainly the French and Indian War in history was one of the rare times I ever heard indigenous people discussed in a classroom. And so by the time I was able to start studying Native American studies, uh, I went all in because it was, again, the most fascinating and exciting story I had never been told. And from that point on, I was like, I could easily spend the rest of my life discussing this with people. Easily and still continue to learn every day. And uh, I've met so many people out there who had my similar experience. Grew up in a place where native culture, history, language, spirituality may not be appreciated as much as I think it should be, uh, and may not have played as prominent a role in their lives as they wanted it to be. So to come back and rediscover that about themselves has been something I've, I've really enjoyed doing. I've gone through that as well. So where you went to school when you were younger, was there other Native kids around, or were you a minority? Uh, definitely a minority. So uh, what, was, uh, what was it like, a classroom that you're in? Uh, I think at this time, in uh, the early 90s, I think it was about 98% uh, white American. Okay. And uh, so in a small school of the grad with... 10th through uh, 12th grade being about 300 kids, 300 young adults, you can imagine that there were not very many. Yeah, now this is making things fire off in my head, because I grew up here on a reservation, and I've spoken to other people, such as yourselves, I grew off, uh, up off reservation, and sometimes they get singled out in those classes uh, around Thanksgiving, and they ask you to kind of represent the people sometimes when you might not even be connected. Do you have experiences like that? Uh, you know what? More afterwards. In, in grade school, yes. Uh, maybe just to relate your personal experience. But um, that was something actually, yeah, I, I tried to avoid because it's, you're a teenager. 
and a young person, it's an awful amount of stress to be, you know, you're already unique. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then all of a sudden, the entire classroom or the entire uh, group's attention is on you. So yeah, uh, I was I was grateful to not have been put in that situation many times. Yeah, and that's and oh. there was a lot of contestation too. Uh, in Minnesota, they were dealing with hunting and uh, fishing rights at the time, and uh, those were very hotly contested issues in in both communities. So uh, that was a, definitely a, a something that was discussed at the time. You know, it makes me want to ask, too, because like I said, uh, I've heard other experiences where people are singled out and they can't really seem to kind of float under the radar. How do you think you were able to do that, kind of? Um, I I don't know. Uh, again, I was just a, just a young man at school, so... <laughs> Uh, that's how must have been really well behaved. I I was I was <laughs> at, at times, especially in the classroom. All right, so now you're in town to do uh, the seven grandfather teachings up at the Niwana Kea Center. Uh, can you tell us a little bit what people can expect attending your teachings? This is a particular talk that it radically transformed my life about eleven years ago. I had reached a point in my career where I had gone through a a radical spiritual transformation. And I had found myself in a spot where I was chronically underemployed teaching Ojibwe. And I could not really afford to continue teaching it. I was kind of impoverishing myself and my family. And I gave myself one last chance. If you had one last chance to go out and talk about something and you weren't going to teach Ojibwe anymore, you can study it every day. I can do that on my own time, but to have that as a profession, as a vocation. What would you talk about? And for me, I had taught like the grammar and the structure of the language. And I thought, I've never discussed these teachings of what the words really mean. And that was the first time I did the seven generations and seven grandfather teachings. And I, I used my experience in history, uh, speaking with elders, and also linguistics and a scientific approach to describing how we can live in peace and balance with our relatives. How all of our actions in this interconnection and in this relationship with all of our relatives will affect someone, not just now, but someone coming seven generations from now. And how do we do that? And what I like to do in this particular teaching is show people that our people have used the sacred law. Uh, we also call these the seven grandfather teachings to show us a way to live Minobomatsuin the good life, a life of peace and balance, a life without conflict with your ecosystem or your relatives, a life without contradiction where you're saying one thing and doing another, a holistic life, a holy life. And we can do that by using de boywin, truth, kwaikwatizwin, virtue, righteousness, honesty, sagi ittiwin, love, dabasendizwin, humility, manaji ittiwin, respect, zungide ewin, strength of heart, courage, and nabuakawin, intelligence, wisdom, and so I'll go over what each one of those words means in the language, rather than just a, a, a translation, rather an interpretation of it. So I, yeah, I'm super excited to give this talk. So a little bit of a feeder question here for you. I mean, what's the, basically for somebody who might just walk in that has no experience in the language or the culture, they say, well, what's the difference if you're learning in the English or the, or the language? I mean, I can understand it better if I hear in English. Uh, what makes it special when you learn about it in the language? There's this genuineness and there's an authenticity when you hear the teachings in the language. And you may get the teaching in English, but when you can hear it in, for me, in Anishinaabe Moen, there is, uh, it becomes very authentic. And this was something I learned, you know, as a young man, as I was beginning to learn the language. There's a fellow who said, listen, You'll hear lots of teachings in English. Ask yourself, can you translate that into Ojibwe? That, there's your litmus test. And uh, if you can, that might be the real thing. If you can't, then you should be suspect. 
<laughs> yep. You know, uh, not condemn right away, but maybe, you know, be inquisitive about where that particular teaching comes from. For me to have my mother tongue be in English and being an Ojibwe second language learner like so many people in my generation, um, I like to think that I have an approach that even someone who isn't interested in learning the language can walk away with at least seven words that could potentially radically change their lives the same way it did for me. And so, and again, remaining authentic and genuine there, it, this radically changed me for the better. Uh, and if I can share that with someone else, I, I don't necessarily feel an obligation. It's joyful for me to do that. I, I would highly encourage them to, to come and check it out. And uh, again, even if you are not Anishinaabe, to come in here, the language and the culture and the spirituality of your friends and neighbors, uh, I, hopefully, I hope it will be uh, an enriching experience for, for anyone who joins. Now on to the Ojibwe word of the week. Um, I'm, like I said before we start recording, I remember when I seen your flyer pop up, you're coming to town. I was like, hey, it's him, because I've been seeing your segments on there. They're really cool segments on Facebook primarily. Or... Exactly. Okay. Um, how long have you been doing that? I just celebrated my five-year anniversary. Five-year anniversary. And tell us about how, how that started. The origin story is... Facebook had just come out with this new feature called Vive. <laughs> yep. The, the, totally dating it, but in my wife um, had got me to do a Periscope live. And then one night said, you should try this live feature. So she's very brilliant and clever. And I thought, I'll do that. And I got on and, and spoke about Name Benigizis, the Suckerfish Moon, our Ojibwe name for February. And it was fun because rather than just saying a word, which I had been doing, I had a chance to kind of describe what the story behind that word. And for me, when I was learning the language, that was so important. It wasn't just the translation, it was the interpretation and the story behind why we call February the, the sucker fish moon. And I thought, oh, if I get like maybe 100 or 200 views, that'll be great. <laughs> and that first one, it, it hit like, 10,000 views. And I'm like, oh, other people are, are as fascinated by this as I am. Yeah, uh, you know, I think I watched it. I think I watched your very first video. Um, I scoured things for different native things to share on Indigenous, and I'm pretty sure I watched that first one. That's really cool. And to have a chance to use social media and that platform to kind of, you know, take about 10 minutes to, to really go in depth with one word was something I enjoyed. That's how I learned from a number of elders was uh, that... You can translate it, but the interpretation of it was where I found the most fascinating stories. And do you find that to be a modern example of uh, the oral tradition? Absolutely. And in fact, after grad school, uh, writing kind of became a chore. I had it associated with work. Prior to yeah. that, I enjoyed writing, and then it became just something I do. And I really wanted to get back to oral tradition. I, On a personal note, I feel like I flourished there. And when I look at it, you know, historically, we have 13,000 years of oral tradition built into our DNA. Like uh, it, for so many indigenous people to, to talk it out, it, it just feels right. And uh, we are so, there are so many others who are just expert at, at talking and uh, yeah. at discussing and filling things out that way. So to be able to do the, the word of the day and talk and not have it be a written paper that was published in some journal, but rather in a, you know, in a forum where anyone with a smartphone could tune in and listen to their language, culture, history, and spirituality. That became uh, something I really enjoyed doing. And on the production side of it, uh, you can do it at any location. The format of your segment is really good. It works out. It's kind of cool seeing the different locations. How many different locations do you think you've been in now in that five years? It's got to be hundreds. Yes. The, the weekly one is downstairs. Uh, we call it the studio. And uh, I'll just set up there. And then over the past year, I've been doing reels short form videos and yeah i tried to do a different location on uh at least two or three times a week so we're looking at you know maybe 150 different about 150 
different places. And this is something you see going on. I mean, like my show, I want to do this until the day I can't do it anymore. Is this yes. something that you just want to keep building and building? I, I really do. I really enjoy it. Uh, it's kind of been nice to do move into the more short form reel. Yeah. And uh, to kind of give myself those parameters of it used to be 30 seconds, but now it's a minute. And, you know, brevity is the soul of wit, as Shakespeare put it. Mm -hmm. To get your message across concisely in a minute, it's been a fun challenge for me. Yeah. And, I, and I enjoy sharing it that way. Um, so the teachings, the Ojibwe word of the week, uh, what else do you do? I'm also a, uh, a speaker. A speaker. Um, I, for the past five years, uh, I've had a, such a schedule that I could no longer commit to working with the public schools in good faith and say I can be here in this schedule because I had an opportunity to travel to so many different places to do keynotes, to do professional development, to do seminars. And uh, then the pandemic started. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that kind of all moved and segued to online, which was exciting for me. I, I stayed in... I stayed very busy and uh, learned how to use Zoom and Microsoft meetings like everyone else. And now I finally have an opportunity to travel and visit and, and speak again. So, and how's that been? Has it been good? Is the world, how's it feel being a traveler? Is the world getting back to normal? Is it forever changed? What's your perspective? It's different, but I think uh, as we're all continuing to heal and in transition, it's it's getting back to maybe a new normal. A new normal. Yeah, that seems to be I the think, phrase. I think that would probably be the best description. It's certainly not like it was. So uh, as a traveler and a language learner, what about a little bit of a language report? Tell us about the state of the language in 2023. Um, well, there is growth in some areas. And uh, that is really exciting to talk about. You see immersion schools uh, where you have children who are learning the language in an immersion environment. And uh, those, yeah, those youth, they are learning miracles. Uh, they are able to learn and acquire language so much quicker and more efficient than you or I, for example, as adult learners. Uh, so there's some really impressive work going on with language immersion. Uh, I think the communities are starting to crave learning the language again, which is good. Uh, it takes time. On the not as positive note, uh, a lot of first language speakers are getting older. Yeah. And that's just, that's, that's nature. Yep. Uh, it's, there's a, there's a tragedy in, in losing the people we love who have taught us, who we love visiting with, who who have carried a heavy load of the language and culture for, you know, maybe 80 winters, maybe even uh, 90 winters. So we're in a, it's a transitional phase. I think uh, with something like uh, the seven grandfather teachings and the, the seven generations and the seven grandfather teachings that people will become more inspired to not just learn the language and even if they don't want to learn it to maybe cherish it and treasure it as as a gift for me it's a an investment it's a 13,000 year investment in us and realizing that this is something that should be not just carried on now but passed down to someone seven generations from now and that'll be our responsibility you know oftentimes the answer to this one is kind of a balance and uh, you know a variety of different styles but what's the best w or, or not best way what way for you is most vital when it comes to learning language the world of academia um the immersion style sitting with your elders and kind of just getting it uh, what what to you is like that key way i get it uh and it's this is unique too because each one of us is unique yeah yeah uh, I felt fortunate because by the time I took my first Ojibwe class, I had learned how to learn a language by going through French immersion. And, you know, there are things that are said in French that are not the same as in English. And some people can't let that go. <laughs> you know, uh, to in French, you would say, I have hunger. I have hunger. In English, it's I am hungry. Yeah. Okay. And there are some people who will not let that go. They will not say, I have hunger. Um, the moment you can realize that they're saying something just differently then you can really start to acquire language 
Uh, and each one's different. For me, I loved school because, again, I had learned how to learn in that environment. Uh, other great ways are language tables. Cell phones. <laughs> Sorry about that. I had, uh, I had taught a language table, which was so cool. Um, it was a community setting that was not a classroom, and that was very important for me. You know, my mother's generation and the people who taught me, many of them went to boarding schools. And for them, school was not a pleasant environment to be in. This was not a place that they enjoyed being. So how could we create a class that was not a classroom? And this was where we had a chance to have tea, to have coffee, to have snacks, and to have like two teachers. We had a Dakota teacher, uh, a friend, colleague, and relative, and uh, myself doing the teachings. And for me, that was a wonderful way to share the language where you weren't going to be tested, you weren't going to be quizzed, you were able just to go and learn the language. And then for younger learners, you know, the immersion seems to be one of the best ways for them to acquire the language. It may actually be a little uh, difficult for adult language learners to learn in an immersion setting, uh, but you can certainly do it, and it, it can certainly accelerate your language acquisition. And I like that you use that word, acquire, acquisition. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between acquiring the language compared to learning the language? Uh, well, you're, for me, they're both the same thing. Uh, you're learning the language, but as you're acquiring it, uh, you're kind of making it your own. It, it's part of you being in a community that you are doing this this one sacred moment of communication where you are sharing a word that has morphemes and phonemes uh, and these sounds and someone else understands you. And uh, yeah, as you're acquiring it, you hopefully are able to use that more and more. And I think that that can have a very healing process. Uh, we have a long and complicated history here with uh, language loss with language usage in the community and with language learning. And so I think for so many people to, to start reclaiming it as part of their identity as, as acquiring that, I think that's, you know, it's, it's very healing and uh, it's very rewarding as well. In your opinion, uh, who are some of the leaders out there, whether they're universities or just schools or community groups? Uh, who are some of the leaders out there when it comes to language revitalization? Uh, oh, this is great because I love shout outs. Uh, one of the schools I'm so impressed with is the Wadoko Dodding School in Wisconsin. They are have done miraculous work. Uh, the stars must have aligned for them to have created such such great curriculum and to have taught so many people the language. Uh, there are some great books that are coming out. Uh, one is uh, by Obazan and his work on Anji King, which is a Ojibwe funerary. It's bilingual. He he wrote that in Ojibwe, and there's an English interpretation. He did that with the big drum, the Ojibwe uh, dream dance drum. Those are fantastic. Uh, Dr. Anton Troyer always has books coming out. I've used his Oshkabewis journal and Living Our Language for years. I love returning to those because you can hear them and read them completely in Ojibwe. And uh, there are some magnificent scholars out there as well who are... Uh, it's not necessarily reappropriating, but who are able to, as indigenous scholars, interpret our language and do in-depth research in our language. And that had been a field that had been, you know, occupied by completely, mostly non-indigenous people until the last 20 years. Of, uh, so to, to see that, it's very impressive. So Something else I wanted to ask about, because I've heard a lot of discussion about it, is uh, dialects from west, east, north, to south. What is your opinion on the different dialects of our language out there? It's, I have studied dialectology for quite a while because I enjoy it. I, I love hearing it from different communities. And I think the late Archie Mose said to, uh, you know, 
appreciate them all. For me, there's a very poetic nature to the language. It's very descriptive. It, it's, it's emotive. Uh, it relates rather than defines. And, you know, when we learn in English, I, th- I would guess in French or Spanish, it's very binary, huh? It's true or false. It's one or zero. It's plus or negative. It's one is the correct answer and the other is not. And I think if you take that approach to the language, you're going to hear someone say, Bama pi, as goodbye rather than gigwabman. And if you are in that, that binary state of mind, one's going to be wrong, mine's going to be right. If you can use it as quantum, <laughs> that there are different depictions and descriptions at different times to use in different places, then I love hearing Bama pi later and and again later i'll talk to you later when it is later rather than gigawabman which would be i shall see you i will see you or gigawabman banama i'll see you later so and it the dialects are vast our land base is vast it begins at the saint lawrence river and goes up to saskatchewan and alberta in montana Uh, So you're going to have a variety of different ways to speak. For me to appreciate how other communities describe the months, describe the geography, describe uh, their relationships, I I have a deep appreciation for it, and I love it every opportunity I have to share with it. So always, when you're introducing yourself in the language, you're actually doing that. You're saying, I'm from this area. That's how we say it here. I'm not here to tell you how to speak the language i'm describing how we say it where i'm from so perfect i love it i got a few uh fun questions for you here um first one you show up at a powwow just starving uh there's no lines you got there at the perfect time so you can get whatever you want what are you looking to order Uh, let's see here my all-time favorite is probably and i don't do it all the time it's a special treat but no the, lines, no, no lines. No lines, special treat. <laughs> it's a kwan. It'll be a piece of fry bread with maple syrup and Ooh. butter. Uh, and the honey butter is good, but it, that one is pretty special. And uh, it's a it's a rare treat, but I yeah, I mean, that. special occasion. Uh, what is your favorite word or phrase in the language? I would... Jawainam. 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 I use that every day. Jawainam. Jawainam. It has three different meanings in Ojibwe. It can mean to have compassion or pity someone. It can mean to love them unconditionally. It can mean to bless them. And uh, you'll probably hear this at the end of ceremonies, but Shawe Namishanam, Shawe Namishanam, Shawe Namishanam, Shawe Namishanam. Please bless, please have compassion, and please love all of us unconditioning because if we're all related we're asking for the same thing for our relatives that we're asking for ourselves big witch uh this one you might have give us a little bit of a hint already with this one what is your favorite language other than anishinaabe i well i love anishinaabe more and i i have a different approach to languages uh languages we speak languages because we're hardwired to do it uh i would have to say i'm the most um, I get the most enjoyment and amusement and uh, fun learning and talking about the Ojibwe language, but I also love deep conversations that I have in in English as well. Uh, It's been really fun to learn a number of languages. So I think we use languages the same reason that we breathe. We we are hardwired to do it. And uh, so I really don't have a favorite. All right. All right. Well, I almost want to hold you down. Like, all right, we get... One language for the rest of Earth. Because <laughs> that's why I was wondering if you go to French right away or what, because um, I had written that question before okay. I got here. So, uh, And then this one steps I away. think Ojibwe is going to go till the end of the Earth. Oh, heck. I mean, that's I, obvious. That's why I, I said I, other than Ojibwe, because that's the favorite, right? Um, yeah, he, there's another fun question. This one steps away from the culture a little bit. Get to know, get to know you this way. Uh, you can get tickets to a concert of your choice. Dead or alive, who would you want to see most? Oh, that's such a good one. Uh, let's get wild. Uh, 
why not the doors the doors okay all that right that would be rock and roll that one really where cool. jim is performing that night and i've i've I'm a big fan, and uh, yeah, that would be a fun one any time to, to see that show. Great answer. Uh, anything else you'd like to talk about or cover? Well, I want to say Apogee Go Miigwech Bizendowik. Thank you all so much for listening. If you want to uh, keep up with me, you can get on my email list at my website, www.jamesvuklich.com, and I'm getting ready to publish my book. Oh, very cool. Uh in early summer, it's the seven generations and seven grandfather teachings. It's, it's very much the stuff that I cover in my keynote speeches, but uh, it's a little more in depth because I'm not constrained by time. Uh, so I have been working on this for a while. I'm delighted that we'll have an early summer publishing date. And if you want an opportunity to read it and even possibly review it before it's released, get on my email list at jamesvuklich.com. And I, and I hope to hear from you. Very cool. And now before we send off, any last words for the listeners out there? Um, a traditional way to end a talk would be Apajigo Miigwech Bizendowie. Thank you all so much for, for listening to me. And Gitchi Miigwech Wendem. I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to be here in Berga, uh, in Kinunabe. And I, I want to take a moment and say Miigwech for talking to me. Thank you.